Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season with your hosts, Lisa and Venkat. Venkat, how's it going today? Hey, Lisa. Right, so what letter are we talking about today? Q, Today is right? like Q, yeah. What kind of right. day are you having today, uh, Venkat? Would you call it a quality day? Well, I just sent off my tax documents to my accountant, so... It started off as a low quality day, but it's become a high quality day now, now that I've finished that chore. I see. Yeah. yeah. So you've been thinking a lot about quality lately, right? So. Yeah, I think particularly like a couple of weeks ago, I had a particularly, we had a long discussion on Twitter about quality. Yes, we did. So yeah, why don't you tell us about what you're thinking about quality? Well, uh, maybe I'll just start with a tweet thread because I think I could talk for a couple hours on the more general like um, direction of it. But uh, so the thread that we got on was ostensibly about signal versus noise, right? You were trying to say that you were um, sometimes that you like to be more noise than signal um, or a source of noise, so to speak. Um, but uh, I think like one way of looking at the signal versus noise, like, so the tweet was like, how do you tell what signal versus noise? Well, it's simple. You figure out where the noise is coming from and you just eliminate it. Because um, once you've eliminated the source of the noise, you know, everything that's left is signal, right? Um, which like signal versus noise, like that whole question is kind of a question of quality. Um, like what's the quality of the signal that you're producing or whatever. Um, but I think like, I can't decide if I should tell more about, I guess I can keep talking about the Twitter thing. Um, okay, yeah, so we started that way and then you were like, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, I've been looking at high-end home goods, specifically like high-end kitchen faucets. I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out which of these producers of high-end kitchen faucets is producing a quality good, like one that's gonna last me a long time. Um, you can end up spending a lot of money on faucets for your home um, and if you, I mean, I, I have no idea what my budget is. I'm just trying to figure out what the landscape looks like, right? Um, before I make any like winnowing decisions. Um, but part of that is like, you know, I'm pretty new to, new to the territory. I've never bought a kitchen faucet before. Um, looking at all the options, how can you tell which of these are actually worth the expensive price and that they've got the craftsmanship, the actual craftsmanship into it? um and quality or quality goods right they're going to be durable they're going to last a long time they're going to look nice they're going to live up to whatever particular aesthetic standard i've set for a kitchen sink thing um a kitchen sink faucet um, so you were looking at a bunch of like website pages for faucet manufacturers right is that how you were like comparing quality because you shared a web page of a particular faucet with me I was just so my 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 process is like I don't even know who the high end quality who the high end faucet people are so a lot of it is like looking through high end interior design magazines or like Instagrams and clicking on links so yeah it's all through their websites it's through but it's through link, links from websites from like um, like I find them like so the source that you find them from is also kind of important right. Um, to some extent. So like Architectural Digest, maybe, I can't remember, or like some like designer or something will have a post of a project they've done and then you can figure out what they used in it. Um, so it's like the source of the stuff. But anyways, one of them had this quote. So the product name was Eclipse and I can't remember what the quote was, but it was some quote about where, how they decided to name their particular product in Eclipse. And this whole thing, like, I was like, okay, like who puts quotes on their, on their faucet pages? <laughs> is the person who's putting a quote like a you know it's like a literary quote right and it's like a reference to some thing i can't remember what it was and it's like okay what does this quote say about the quality of the manufacturer like is the signal wait, or is uh, wait, the noise? Uh, are we talking about the fact that they chose to use a literary quote for marketing a faucet or the content of the quote itself what was it that uh, triggered your red flag yeah, the flag. Yeah. So what triggered my flag is the fact that they were quoting like a literary, like it was like, clearly they were attempting to give their faucet a pedigree. Okay. Um, it was like a pedigreeification of the faucet. And I was trying to decide, okay, is this like, are they giving their, are they giving their faucet a pedigree because they want the faucet to be like because part of paying a lot of money for a thing is because they have pedigree and so if you can establish that your object has a pedigree then you can justify the high price that people are paying for it 
Or so what is the quote? You... Do you remember? Was it like something about relevant to faucets or something like about sunsets or something? I can't remember. I think it was more like some random thing about like sunsets or the moon moving or whatever. <laughs> okay. And I was trying to decide because I think that there are two types of people who make faucets, high end faucets, right? This is like my kind of, and this is where the whole like signal versus the noise like comment original tweet came from is I think you can kind of take people making high end faucets and divide them into two, um, into two categories. Those who are making high end faucets because they really want to produce a good high quality product. And then those who are making high end faucets because they want to make high pedigree products. Um, and I would prefer to buy a, a faucet from the first group and not the second. So if I can figure out a way to determine which type of like category these people are in, and I'm not saying that people who are people who are producing quality products sometimes attribute quotes to their products also like on the product page and like give it a story kind of like you know like some really good writing at the beginning of every chapter they have a nice pithy quote that mm -hmm. usually fits in with the theme really nicely. Um, but you can use the quality of the quote to decide whether or not, like, it's actually, I guess it's like, if you just thought, oh, it includes a quote, that means it's high quality, right? If you just stopped at that level and you didn't go beyond it to look at the reason why the quote was included, um, you would, I, I could see it being like, kind of like hard to tell if it was signal or noise. But if you know the motivation for adding the quote, like I, as I've identified in one case, this is clearly a pedigree attempt to add a quote. So this is a pedigreed attempt. Um, so the motivation for putting the noise out there, the sig like putting the noise being the quote, adding the quote to your product page, the motivation was pedigree. Um, and as soon as okay. you that so, out, uh, you let me let, back up, back up. So yeah. Let me see if I'm following the story so far. So listening to you, I hear about three kinds of indicators of quality that you've kind of mentioned. And I think you sort of, uh, you kind of did it in a free, free association kind of way, but mm. the, the three I picked out are one, you mentioned things like how you actually find candidate faucets through things like architectural digest. Now that's sort of uh, quality by sort of appeal to authority. So somewhere in your head, there's an association between something like architectural digest and your sense of quality that's kind of solid. So that's like a high signal link between what Architectural Digest thinks of as quality and what you think of as quality. So there's like almost simpatico. Then you sort of alluded to your idea of quality where you kind of like re uh, rattled off a bunch of attributes like uh, durability, looks good, fits your sense of aesthetics. So that was kind of interesting because it was a mix of like things that are related vaguely to the sort of engineering function of faucets and then things that are more related to the subjective um, sort of um, aesthetics that you bring to the faucet party, right? So there's the appeal to authority, then there's uh, Lisa's idea of what a good faucet is. And then the third one is this kind of interesting thing about what the message says about the intentions of the people making the faucet. And you've made a distinction between, all right, it's not the quote itself, but whether the quote is about trying to like claim pedigree versus trying to like actually express something about the product and you want people who express something about the product rather than um, just want to signal pedigree. Did I yeah, exactly. follow the story so far? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, but it, like, yeah, so anyways, like, mm, I think in some of these cases, it's like, is pedigree quality, I guess, is like the real question, sort of. So let me share an anecdote that I think is kind of um, illuminating in this regard. So back in the 80s, uh, when there was the whole total quality movement going on and it was coming to America from Japan. So the whole quality movement, it went from like American uh, sort of manufacturing uh, leaders like, you know, Juran and Deming to Japan and Japan adopted and embraced it much earlier, like in the 50s and 60s. But then in the 80s, it kind of got re-exported back to America as part of the quality movement. And this is a book, I forget which book I read. It might have been Tom Peters, Thriving on Chaos. But he, and this is like, I read it when I was a teenager in the 80s. So this is stuck in my head for like 30 years as an interesting quote about quality. But he compared advertising about cars from Japan versus GM. So Japan at that point, either Toyota or Honda or some company had put out an ad with like a really, uh, with a picture of a really high quality uh, craftsman comb, like, you know, a traditional comb made by like Japanese craftsmen for like hair. 
and like ivory or something like that. And there was some sort of message saying that we bring this kind of attention to quality to our car engineering as we do to traditional Japanese combs. And because at that time, the sort of premise of the competition between Japanese and American automakers was that American cars had gotten shitty in quality and Japanese cars were better in quality. This was early 80s. Uh, GM was trying to compete and they apparently had an ad. So I should try to dig this ad up. But the slogan on the ad was, uh, nobody sweats the details like GM. So uh, Tom Peter's comment on that was, look at sort of how the two advertisements signal quality. One is sort of uh, signaling to a deep sort of uh, cultural value of quality that comes in like Japanese manufacturing traditions. And the other has this image of like a sweaty assembly line worker, kind of like just training really hard to make quality. And I, I don't know if um, Tom Peter's reading of the uh, comparison is the right one, but his claim was, this shows you that GM was like just anxious and trying to copy Japanese uh, sort of advertising about quality. And they kind of like totally tone deaf missed the whole point. And that actually signaled that they didn't actually have a quality ethos and didn't understand quality. And I think I bought it at the time. I don't know if I still buy it, but yeah, a slogan like nobody sweats the quality like GM kind of misreads at least the Japanese notion of quality because if you're sweating the details, that's that, that's a different kind of attention than attention to quality, right? So right. does this fit into your sort of uh, frame of uh, thinking about quality? Yeah, I think so. And I think it's interesting that like, yeah, that, I think it's interesting that we're, you can make it in the advertising or I guess advertising is a signal that you're sending out about your product, right? Um, so it's interesting that you can look at these signals of advertising being the signal and try and decide what the actual reality is behind it, like how true of a signal that is to whatever it is that they're attempting. I guess, yeah, signal versus noise. Yeah, so it's, it's actually about truth, right? So there's an additional wrinkle where you're talking about like establishing pedigree versus saying something about sort of the ethos of the product. Mm -hmm. But even if it's establishing pedigree, sometimes we believe that signal about pedigree. So when a Japanese car company like puts a picture for comb and says, you know, this is our quality thing. <clears throat> it, it feels true because it's appealing to something we already associate with quality like Japanese craftsmanship or something like that. At least now we do back in the seventies, maybe not like Japanese cars had like a reputation for poor quality early on. But uh, like, I think the, when a company like GM in 1984 making a claim like nobody sweats the details like GM I think back then it would have basically rung false. Like people knew what GM cars were like, the build quality. They would have known the reputation of Detroit factories. They would have known that Detroit factories are like kind of messy and not very well run. So it would just have rung false. But maybe there's contexts in which that line would ring true. Like, actually that's a good way to pose the question. Is there a sort of person who could make the claim? So the particular phrase, nobody sweats the details like me. Like who could make that claim in a way that actually conveys a notion of quality? So I don't know, maybe a Texan barbecue person, like, you know, somewhere where it's, it speaks to something authentic. Is there any amount of sweating that sweating is a quality, like an attribute of the quality of the good is, is I yeah. like another way of rephrasing that, yep. interesting. Um, I like Texas barbecue. I mean, I think like if you're running a race or doing like some amount of, um, I don't know, like we get like, I guess I'm thinking like um, fast delivery of, a, of an object. Um, hopefully you're sweating by the time you, you drop off like the package huh. I was sending overnight. Um, Though I don't know if idiomatically that's what the phrase indicates. I think sweating the details is sort of indicative of an anxious attitude towards quality. So whereas um, Japanese quality would be kind of like meditative, Zen, like um, sort of attention to detail, sweating the details to me sounds like you're pulling all nighters and you're not going to rest until you get it exactly right. Kind of like OCD anxiety kind of detail. How would you describe your approach to getting producing a quality good Venkat? Uh, I actually, yeah, that's a, that's a good question because I keep having, I think, arguments with like very uh, aesthetically oriented people. 
um, on multiple fronts, but uh, my own approach to quality, I think is um, fundamentally mediocre. My approach is I'm just gonna do like shit post level stuff. And sometimes when sort of the uh, value of what I'm trying to say is high enough, it'll sort of overwhelm sort of any sort of rough edges in terms of like what somebody else might think of as quality. So I think if I had to summarize, I would say my, my sense of quality is basically substance. So if I have to like add polish and gloss to it to make it appear like quality, I'm not going to do it. So if my stuff cannot look high quality while being kind of rough and somewhat unfinished, I'm not going to like try to do that thing. What's your emotion towards the quality that you do produce? Like the, the substantive or I forget the word you use to describe your... Yeah, substance is uh, not substantive, but just substantial as in the substance to it. It's not like, uh, like you, you, you know the marketing phrase, um, over promise and under deliver. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say my ethos is probably under promise and over deliver. So kind of like almost sandbag expectations and like, um, I don't know, keep a low profile. And then when people actually like what you're doing, it, it's sort of uh, more of a thing. What's yours? What, like, what's your sort of uh, epigrammatic way of uh, thinking about quality? About quality, um, interesting. I you have a phrase like is, under I believe promise it's and findable, order. and I believe that it is like achievable. Um, so I think it's reasonable for me to ask for and look for it in products and the own my own work that I produce, right? So um, I believe in it. Um, I know it when I see it. <laughs> So let's talk about um, you as a producer I I, rather than it's... consumer. So uh, well, not I, in... think, I think what I'm saying, though, is it's something that you kind of iterate your way towards. Like, you know, it exists. You just have to keep looking for it. You'll find it if you keep like keep trying hard enough or not not to keep trying hard enough, but keep like keep in the game long enough to produce quality. Is the quality you produce or you specifically is the quality you produce in, say, your Bitcoin programming or something? the same sort of quality as the quality you demand when you buy faucets or I whatever like else you buy? I think so, yeah. So I feel like I had a much better feel for quality when I was producing Android applications because they're more of a visual and like, like there's a tactility and a visual quality to an app that you don't get quite in the sort of programming that I'm doing right now, or at least I haven't. I'm really working on developing my aesthetic sensibilities and backend code in a way that hasn't wasn't exercised the first half decade of my career. Um, like the first half decade, I spent a lot more time doing visual constructions mm -hmm. um, or making things real. And I feel like, so yeah, I feel like that is like, it's literally just an iterative thing. You just have to try a bunch of stuff. And it's a little bit of like being willing to, it's interesting because like we were talking about sweating, but it's not, I wouldn't call it sweat. It's, I mean, it's putting the time into it, but I wouldn't say that any amount of sweating makes it necessarily better. Um, it's literally like how many times have you looked through it? And that's like, it's, have you spent time with it? Like experiencing the thing? Um, that's a good way to put it. It's almost like the quality of the object is um, somehow the same as the quality of the time you spend with it. So if you have like calm meditative attention while crafting the thing, the object will come out with sort of a calm and meditative quality. If you sort of have like this anxious OCD kind of thing, it'll have like an anxious quality to it. Maybe, I don't know, I'm, this is Maybe. a hypothesis. And I think it's really hard to produce something that gives a good experience if it hasn't, someone hasn't intentively experienced it. Yeah. So let's go back to the uh, tweet thread and um, mm. yeah, the, the signal and noise idea. And uh, I was sort of initially dismissing you as you're just another sort of quality uh, uh, person obsessed with quality, kind of like uh, Robert Piercig's um, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, where he has a whole metaphysics of quality kind of thing. He which, does. Yeah. So you claim that your approach to quality is like totally different. So can you talk about that? Yeah, I would. I can't really remember. I have really bad problems. I'll remember <laughs> a thing, but I don't like remember exactly the thing. My brain does like, I call it like a roll up thing. I only like, pull the lessons out that I need and move forward with like the updated state machine and like the exact <laughs> process that it took to update the state machine it gets totally lost because that wasn't 
part of the data model that got saved. Um, I hate making programming metaphors, but sometimes they're really like the best way to explain. Yeah, things. totally. Anyways, okay. So I'm, all that to all of that to say, all that preface, just to say that I don't quite remember what per sig's um, exact approach to quality is. So I mean, I remember it like. So for re listeners who aren't familiar with what we're talking about, Robert Persig was a man who wrote a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I believe he published it in the early 80s, late 70s. Um, so it's been around a long time. It was my favorite thing about this book. I think there's a lot of really interesting things in it. He talks a lot about how building a machine, maintaining a machine, the art of being a mechanic for yourself, um, understanding deeply things in your life that you depend on, like a motorcycle if you're riding around a lot. Um, I thought he had a really interesting point about Plato and Plato's, the impact and of Plato's um, teaching and understanding on Western thought of what quality actually is. I don't exactly remember where he ends up though, like where he concludes. So I'm going to take a guess at it because I think my memory is even foggier than yours since I read it in the 80s, so it's 30 years old. But the uh, Plato connection through, I think he, the character calls himself uh, Phaedrus, which is Plato's dialogue character. But I think it has something to do with uh, the idea of platonic realms, right? So like a square you might draw on a piece of paper is a representation of the abstract idea of a square that lives in the platonic realm which has like the pure essence of like squareness. So I assume when he talks about like the quality of motorcycle maintenance or whatever, there's sort of a platonic realm where there is this idealized perfect mm -hmm. essential motorcycle and sort of you're trying to like grasp that essence of motorcycleness through your sort of uh, interactions with the real physical imperfect motorcycle. So that's the sense of it that I remember vaguely, but yeah, uh, let's take it from there. Okay, so let's assume he meant something like that. So, uh, yeah, but I think that like, I think there's something this like Zen like quality is quality is like kind of has, like I feel like he at the end kind of gets into this metaphysicalness of quality of like yep. what it means to exist as a human and experience quality as a life like mm -hmm. experience, right? I think. Um, yeah, he gets there. He has like this like long extended metaphor about being on a mountain somewhere and like being in the grass or like looking out, spending an afternoon with friends or something. And this was sort of related to quality somehow. <laughs> Clearly, I remember it's very okay. good specifics. Yeah. Um, but the yeah, so like so the place that I took this, I I haven't actually I haven't act I didn't actually take that and then attempt to apply it to any aesthetics or any like. And it's where I feel like most people would take that to like forms and like kitchen faucets or like um, what's motorcycle maintenance or code writing. I didn't do any of that. That wasn't where my brain went with it. My brain went, took this and said, what does quality say about which of the probabilities? So like I took it and I applied it to the experience that we have with quantum physics, like what quantum physics attempts to say about the world. Um, and this is actually kind of the birth of this like mini sub project, which I haven't written anything on in like a couple of years called quantum rhetoric, uh, which you had a really good way of summing it up, which is like you had a tweet that was like, is the world a quality, is the existence, is this universe a quality product, I think, right? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what this quantum rhetoric is trying to get at is like based on this multiversic, multi-universe, whatever thing that we can observe at the quantum level, how does that relate to the Zen-like quality of experience of like, kind of like the Zen ability to experience every moment as it happens? And like, kind of like the Siddhartha, what's his name? Is Siddhartha the, the Buddha? Who's the original yeah, Buddha? Yeah, that was his- uh, Yeah, the yeah. original, the original Buddha, like this experience of like just existing, right? It's pure existence. To some extent, like physics or like writing the multiverse, I think is the same experience as achieving Zen. And that is a quality experience. And so you can like, why? And like, why is that? It's because experiencing the moment is accepting and seeing all of the possibilities that can happen from that moment and neither like concentrating on one or the other, but just living them as they happen. 
And that is like the most pure experience that we as humans can have of the quantum universe. And that is quality. Okay. So it's like. L it's let me try and sort of bring that down to, um, I, I don't know, more concrete example. So two things that reminds me of that way of thinking about it. Uh, one is like a literal example from like quantum mechanics, which is, you know, uh, the path a light ray takes when refracting through a liquid, right? Yeah. So uh, Feynman uh, sort of explained that as the quantum least action principle. So literally a ray of light that goes from point A to point B from so, say air to water takes the shortest path. And it's like, how does it know what the shortest path is? And there's like a whole quantum thing about it, which I never quite understood, but it yeah. It travels all of them. Exactly. So everything except the, so all the paths and then everything that's not the shortest path gets canceled out. But that was famous that explanation. But the is the shortest. Yeah. And there's sort of, I still didn't quite get how sort of the teleological um, aspect is handled. But this also reminds me like going way back to like Leibniz. Leibniz had his philosophical idea of like, we live in, what is it? What's the phrase? All is for the best in this best of all possible worlds. So that's called Leibnizian optimism, right? So believing that you happen to live in the best of all possible worlds. And uh, I think there's a whole train of thought in both East and West. So the Western way would be from Leibniz to uh, Feynman talking about light rays propagating in a certain way to your favorite guy, David Deutsch, uh, sort of explaining quantum physics a particular way. And uh, I think the Zen angle would be similar kind of. Like if you read a lot of the sort of Zen and the art of archery kind of books, it's it's got that same kind of live in the moment and every moment is perfect in itself kind of like ethos about it, right? Yeah, you know what's really interesting? So like this is, this is one of my favorite things that I learned from Feynman or reading Feynman's work is that there's a lot of different ways to describe the same phenomena um, and a lot of different like, and sometimes sometimes like all that philosophy is, is the art of updating things that have been said a million times in the past into a way that makes sense and irrelevant to the people of the present. Um, and like Feynman, I still like the example that Feynman actually in, was involved in is there were two different ways, two different wave for, two different ways of expressing the movement of light or photons, right? The wave theory, and then I can't remember what the other one was, like the, the part particle of the theory, theory, right? Yeah. Particles, so, right? Wave and particles, so that was the classic Newton versus Huygens version. No, there were actually like, but there was like actually two different things going on, like two different ways, like two different systems of equations have been developed to describe how light moves, how photons move. Oh. And Feynman was one of the people who sat down and said, no, these are actually exactly the same. They look very different and they're using entirely different equations, but they're describing exactly the same underlying oh, okay. domain in equally fidelity, like they're both have high fidelity of correctly produce, pre mm -hmm. um, correctly describing the phenomena. They're just like built on different um, processes, so to speak, or they're built on different primitives is what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like my way of describing how quality, you know, how can, how can the result, how can living in a quantum world, like to what impact, to what effect does that impact us as like our actual experience as humans and like arriving at, oh, it's like, you know, the quality that Persig is talking about is kind of the best you can hope for, which is very similar to like what Zen adherents attempt to achieve through reaching that like enlightenment. It is enlightenment and the quality, equality existence is an enlightened existence. Um, but I think that there's like 10 different ways that people have come to that same conclusion throughout the time. I'm just the first one maybe to be like, oh, but we like the quantum results proves that the best way to live your life provably is through enlightenment, um, <laughs> which would be novel. Okay, that's, anyway, that's, that's, very... the whole, that's the whole quantum rhetoric project is like attempting to prove that science says the best way to live your life is an, is an enlightened life. Wait, uh, so you put up this website a couple of years ago, right? Have you done yeah. anything with it? Like, uh, what's the no, not program? Since, not really. <laughs> I've got some books I've been meaning to read, and like, I, clearly, there's a lot more to write about. Um, I think there's a lot more to write about ar around this, but. Um... Okay, so uh, I think we have a couple of mo more minutes. So let me throw another challenge question at you. So, just like for re religious people who believe in God, the main actual philosophical problem to explain is the you know 
uh, presence of evil or pain in the world, right? That talking to religious people, that's the sense I get that that's the main question they struggle with. If there's God, how is there evil and pain in the world, right? Oh, okay. So if um, we bring that similar kind of questioning to your quantum rhetoric, if it's true that um, uh, and enlightenment is the most quality way to live and all things have that enlightened quality, whether it's faucets or cars or motorcycles and people's minds, everything, um, then I guess the problem would be how do you explain lack of quality or things that come across as not having quality? So what is the essence of non-quality? Is it like an illusion or is there such a real thing as this is a crappy car or that's a crappy faucet? Is that a real sense? Or is it just that we are not enlightened enough to appreciate in what sense that crappy faucet is actually optimal in some other broad sense? I mean, I would just say that the people making the faucet haven't spent, invested any of their own time experiencing it. It's just as simple as that. Okay. Like, like, I think that it's possible to design things and produce things that you just don't spend any time with. And the way that like design and engineering are set up now, it's incredibly easy to design and produce and then mass, mass sell a thing that no one has spent any time with. Okay. Except the buyers. And I guess the way you could connect it to your signal and noise idea is if you don't spend enough time with a product to sort of build it in an enlightened way, then you kind of have like a fake thing that you then have to sell as a real thing. And that's where your intentions and motivations get mixed up and you send like confusing signals, right? Yeah. Would that be a fair summary of your signal yeah, I think and noise a, version? a nice way to like sum it up. Yeah. Okay. I think this is kind of what I was getting at with the idea of premium mediocre as well. Mm. Um, when it's like mediocre that signals quality of premium without actually having it. Anyway. Huh. So two different ways of describing the same thing. There we go. All right. What do you say? QED, our... and thus it is proved. Um... Yep. QED on quality and quantum physics. Yeah. All right. All right, Venkat, I'll talk to you next week. All right, next week then. So, Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.